So great to have everybody here and to uh, be together. Uh, this is our uh, virtual uh, fundraising event uh, with Noel Castellanos, who's uh, going to be sharing with us. And it's great to have everybody here. Um, as you all know, YWAM San Francisco is one of, is located in one of the more challenging neighborhoods of San Francisco, although many neighborhoods are challenging, all in different ways. Um, and uh, we've been one of those few places in San Francisco uh, during COVID where people could come and get a shower and get help with the unhoused. And the ministry is just growing in leaps and bounds. And uh, we want to share some of that with you today. Uh, we're kicking off this virtual fundraiser um, from now till the end of the year. Uh, this will end at 1.30, so you're, you won't be on till the end of the year. But uh, our efforts start now to the end of the year, making up 110 k shortfall. Um, a lot of our revenue got wiped out this year due to COVID um, with all the incoming teams and students that we normally host. Um, and so we're in a drive right now to make up that shortfall. And the good news is, is we have a, a $10,000 matching fund today. So anything you give today doubles. Um, and just so that you know, we've estimated very carefully that just taking care of one person uh, through all the services that we do, whether it's pop-up church or it's um, our showers or it's taking them to through the bureaucracy uh, system to get their IDs or to get them housing. It costs us about $36 and 46 cents uh, for every person that we just reach out and continue to help. Uh, so there'll be an opportunity to uh, give during the time. Links will be going up even now as I'm talking of uh, uh, where you can give. But it's a pleasure today to have on the call uh, Steve Binquist, who will be sharing stories. Uh, Steve is the um, director of YWAM San Francisco uh, Neighborhood Services, um, and he's really engaged in the neighborhood with his team and helping all of us at the center to really focus down on the neighborhood. And also with us on the call that's going to be taking the majority of our time, and I'm really looking forward to it, is uh, Noel Castellanos, uh, who's going to be sharing with us uh, from the richness of his experience in working in broken neighborhoods. Uh, so in the chat, we want to put, you can uh, have his website and the books that he's written. Uh, one of his books that he's written, what a great title is Where the Cross Meets the Street. And that's what we're going to be talking about today is where the cross meets the street. How can we pursue shalom in our neighborhood. So I want to kick it right off and bring Noel right onto the screen and uh, ask Noel, um, how do you define shalom? If you could just give us some thoughts on that for a while, that would be very helpful. Thank you uh, for uh, the opportunity to be here with you. Uh, it's uh, hard for me to jump right in without reflecting for a minute about um, my very first assignment outside of uh, when I left college, Whitworth University in 1982, um, and I moved to San Francisco, lived in the Mission District, uh, 21st in Valencia, real close to uh, where you all are, and uh, really, I would say so much of the formation of the theology and the thinking and the practice that uh, I will be sharing some thoughts on today began there. And uh, I, I, when I think about the word and the idea of, of pursuing shalom, uh, the, the verse that uh, most of us uh, are most familiar in scripture uh, that talks about that word explicitly is in Jeremiah chapter 29. And uh, the, the, the people, of, uh, a not large number of, uh, of uh, God's folks have been exiled to Babylon. And uh, when they are there in this very uh, kind of tenuous and vulnerable place and 
dealing with the idea that uh, all of the dreams and the possibilities and the recognition of fa having fallen short of God's uh, desire and plan for them, uh, they, they are having to reckon with the idea that, that they're in exile. They're not where they want to be. And in the middle of that place, God still has a, a, uh, a word for uh, his uh, followers. And, and he says, uh, build homes and plan to stay, plant gardens and eat the foods they produce, marry and have children, then find spouses for them so that they may have grandchildren, multiply, do not dwindle away, and <clears throat> work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare, in its welfare, uh, you will determine your welfare. And I, I think one, one of the things that you find in that uh, verse and, and that command really is that uh, the idea of pursuing shalom is something that we've got to uh, work at. It's something that uh, God uh, has uh, planted in our hearts. It's part of what it means to know him and to walk with him and to understand God's love and purposes in the world is to understand this idea of shalom. When we hear that word, many of the translations that you and I have read, the word is translated peace, right? And uh, to seek the peace of the city uh, would be uh, in itself uh, at face value, uh, an amazing thing. Imagine in all of the war torn places and uh, violent places in our world, if there were a group of men and women that were working uh, earnestly to work for peace, uh, and, uh, and if uh, we were really taking to heart Jesus's words in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, blessed are the peacemakers. But the idea of shalom that we find in Jeremiah and is expanded upon throughout the Old Testament, and then we'll, we'll talk about how that uh, kind of um, uh, morphs into a deeper concept that, that maybe we're more familiar with in the New Testament is the idea of, of wholeness, of wellness, of completeness, an idea uh, of, of uh, not just uh, the absence of conflict, but it's a, a thriving, a human thriving, a spiritual thriving, this, this deep sense that uh, we are able to breathe and we're able to sense the goodness of God all around us. Uh, I remember being in Miami for uh, one of our CCDA conferences many years ago, and uh, the speaker said uh, that shalom was the idea that nothing is missing and nothing is broken, right? And we know that that is the, uh, the work of God's kingdom people, is to be about seeing this kind of world become a reality for more and more uh, folks, beginning with ourselves. And, and I think if, uh, uh, Tim, over the years, if there's been a, uh, a, a deepening in my own understanding is how deeply uh, we need shalom individually. Uh, many of us on this call, we are here because we are involved, engaged in ministry. We see ourselves as helpers, as servants, as ministers, as investors. You know, we, we have this desire to be involved in this work. And uh, what we can never forget is it begins in our own lives, right? Uh, uh, what is God wanting to do in us today? What's he wanting to make new? Uh, what are the ways that we have fallen short and and where do we repent and where do we recognize our, our own deep need that, uh, to recognize that like Henry Nouwen says, uh, in, in reality, we're broken and we're wounded healers, right? And, and, and I think to me, that's the hope uh, of uh, doing this for the long haul because uh, you've been in ministry, uh, like I started there in San Francisco, how many years ago? Well, a lot of bumps and bruises along the way. And, uh, and uh, uh, the, the simplicity or the 
naivete of, of thinking that, uh, you know, I'm the helper and I'm there to help people who are broken uh, without recognizing our own brokenness is, uh, is something that uh, uh, really the Lord will allow us to uh, deeply understand the longer we do this kind of work. Steve, you want to just uh, tell us a little bit, uh, as uh, Noel just really defined shalom really well, uh, just uh, tell us a little bit about pursuing shalom uh, in the initial stages of, of what that really looks like through services. And yeah. then, I want, then, I'll, then I'll ask Noel to expand on that. I mean, so much of who we are and what we do is based in relationship, and that relationship often starts with acts of service. Um, and for us, showers has been really key. And one of the just, I think a story that just sums up the showers is we had a gentleman who was experiencing homelessness, came in uh, and kind of waited his time, his turn and was uh, just solemn and quiet and a little grumpy. And, um, you know, got his 15 minute shower. It was a typical cold San Francisco day and he got his 15 minute shower. And just after he had gotten dressed and gotten ready, he came out of the shower, his hands looked at high just kind of saying over and over, like, I'm born again, I'm born again. And just that, uh, the, you know, soap on the body, fresh shower, um, having a safe space, a lockable door for 15 minutes um, was really powerful for him. And I think that's a little bit of what pursuing Shalom in the neighborhood through services, it's, it's giving people that dignity or that peace. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's a story that is always really warm in my heart um, and what we want to continue to see happen is uh, we are able to be more with the community and open up more and more. Um, we're hoping to provide more services and more relationship-based and community-based kind of uh, events and programs um, through our pop-up church um, that meets on Sunday mornings, um, able to give haircuts again, um, to continue to uh, do our, our showers for the neighborhood, our drop-ins and um, our movie days and things that we were doing that we want to really meet back that just provide a sense of dignity, community and service to, to this community. And um, yeah, it's uh, one of the things that I'm really excited about as we move forward. Um, so yeah. Thanks, Steve. And uh, Noel, can you just uh, expand a little bit more on that initial stage of building shalom uh, through services. Uh, Steve was talking about the showers and haircuts that we do, and even a pop-up church, which we have, which is really meeting felt needs. It's, it's people meeting on the street in chairs, the street closes down and we fill up that street every Sunday morning at eight o'clock. And then after that service, there's another one at 1030 inside our building with Dennis Adams, who's on the call here. But, Noel, could you share a little bit about how pursuing shalom through services really takes place and elaborate a bit more on that? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, I, I, some of you saw on my um, chat that uh, I'm living in a place called Huntsville, Alabama today, okay? After uh, being born along the border, uh, Mexican-Texas border, uh, and living there for a number of years in the Bay Area, uh, San Francisco, and then uh, 30 years in Chicago in a Mexican neighborhood uh, where uh, really uh, the most uh, formative uh, years of my ministry and, and where the, the, so some of the themes in, in uh, where the cross meets the street really came to fruition. Uh, I, I think about where I am today, and uh, we're living in a community that is uh, about 300,000 people. Uh, and really, you don't you don't think about Huntsville as a, a place of incredible uh, need. Uh, it's in many ways a very wealthy community compared to everywhere else I've lived. And uh, and when when uh, people look at the idea of doing church and doing ministry, it really revolves around uh, the concept of proclamation of uh, bringing people together and hearing a good sermon and 
you know, it, 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 it involves uh, doing the work of ministry because in every location imaginable, even in a place of great resource, there is a uh, deep need. But when you're called to places uh, like uh, where we feel called to be in, in marginalized communities and in, uh, in I, I would say like this in the Galilees and the Nazareths of the world, you know, can anything good come from Nazareth? They said about Jesus's hometown. Uh, I, I think about uh, the reality is that you don't simply show up and begin uh, preaching the good news uh, and, and talking about God's love without first earning people's trust and earning people's respect and letting people know that you see them where they are and that you recognize that uh, like this concept of shalom, it, it, it is a, it's a very, it's, a, it's, 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 it's very fleshy, the concept, you know, it's the incarnation, it's God coming and becoming one of us not just calling us to love the poor, but becoming poor himself. And, and that means that uh, uh, we, we've got to start by uh, taking the simple steps that we find in a passage like Matthew 25, where you look around you in uh, a place like the Tenderloin in San Francisco or La Villita, where I've uh, spent so much of my time along the border, and you see human suffering and human need, and you recognize that part of being uh, human ourselves is to have the capacity to not walk past that and not ignore that deep hurt. And to say, before I begin doing anything else, uh, oftentimes uh, I'm going to take a step and say, okay, what is it? What's the felt need here? What's what's uh, what are people screaming for and asking for? And uh, I'll never forget moving into San Francisco. Right. And uh, uh, we knew that the public schools were one of the places where a lot of our children were not get, uh, having the kind of opportunity that most kids in, in a lot of school districts and zip codes get. And so it was just coming in and. Uh, becoming uh, involved in those schools as tutors, as mentors. Sometimes it was just uh, walking the halls and making sure that you could break up fights during lunch meetings. And, and then for me, it, it also involved, uh, you know, coaching sports. And uh, so it was being present like that and, and just loving and reaching out. And, uh, and then, uh, the more you hang out, and I know we're going to talk about presence in a, in a few minutes, but, but the more you hang out and the more you're there and the more you're incarnate in a community, uh, the more it becomes very obvious uh, the simple things that uh, we do. Uh, you know, uh, I, I don't know how many folks are going to write these big uh, uh, ministry plans around showers right? Oh, man, we're going we're gonna to just open up the showers, and we're going to, you know, uh, that, but I'll tell you what, uh, when you're working in, in, among a population of men and women, that, that there is nothing that would feed the soul more than having that uh, cleanly, you know, that, that water flow down, and hopefully it's warm, you know, in the U.S. it's warm, uh, Latin America, not so much, in other parts of the world, uh, but I, I just, I, and then we just look at the life of Jesus, right? And and it's, and uh, it, it's not like this uh, superhero come in and rescue the day and heroic acts. It seems to be very simple things: treating people with love and dignity, uh, reaching out and being available, and offering that cup of water and that extra jacket or whatever it might be. And uh, the longer we're in a city, uh, those acts of service become a lot more sophisticated, right? Where you realize uh, not only do we offer a shower, but sometimes we got to figure out how do we build homes and how do we uh, make sure that roads are working and, uh, and it, it pushes us to pursue things like justice and uh, going to court with people and looking at immigration policy, 
but it really begins with this very simple idea that is rooted in the character of God. God is a God who gives. God is a God who empties himself for uh, even though he was God, he did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped onto and, and to hold onto and but he emptied himself, that kenosis, that emptying of, of our lives to say, I'm here for you. And, and Jesus uh, obviously did that in, in the pouring out of his own life and uh, giving everything so that people would know, listen, there's somebody in your corner. There's somebody that loves you and cares for you and somebody that sees you. I, I think uh, in order to serve somebody, uh, first of all, you got to see them, right? And I, and I think that's probably uh, the most impactful thing that many of us do every day is that we learn the people, you know, the person's name on the corner and, you know, uh, and uh, so that, that shalom permeates that vision of shalom of, of, of moving beyond, uh, at some point you got to move beyond service, right? But we start oftentimes with an act of emptying, which is uh, as life-giving to us as it is to those that uh, are on the receiving end. Yeah, that's uh, really key, Noel. Thank you so much. It, pursuing shalom through service then leads to really being there. And without being present, um, you know, it's great uh, short-term efforts. <laughs> but the long-term presence really makes a difference. And um, just reminds me of a story that uh, uh, one of our workers, Isaiah, uh, who's working the tech behind the scenes here for us, um, he was out on the street one day and uh, you know, our, our, our neighborhood, um, at the front of our building, inside of our building, it's known as a safe place. But there's a lot of activity going on all the time. People hanging out uh, around the building. They come for showers. They come for haircuts. They come for bathroom services. They come for hygiene kits. They come for socks. They come for the Gospels of John. They come for all sorts of things that we're trying to provide. Uh, someone asked in the chat, what is that uh, $36 uh, dollars, uh, time period? Well, it, it covers it covers all the things that we do for maybe one person over a uh, uh, an extended period of time, you know, because they come and they go, but we keep on following up with them. But uh, Isaiah was out working uh, on the sidewalk one day, and uh, we'll call the guy John for the sake of the story. He was helping him to helping this guy named John get his ID so that he could get into housing. That's one of the things that we do. And um, Isaiah had to leave him and run back into the building to go get something. And so he was gone for a few minutes. And uh, when he came back, uh, John, who he was trying to help, uh, told him, he said, man, I just got kind of beat up by the drug dealer uh, on the block. And uh, Isaiah said to John, he said, I'm really sorry. You know, this is a safe place in the neighborhood. We're a safe haven. And I don't want that happening around our building, inside our building. And um, Isaiah just got some courage and with fear and trembling, uh, he said, I'm going to go over and talk to the drug dealer. And so he went over to the drug dealer and he said, um, hey, you know, uh, I heard you hit John uh, just a few minutes ago. And the drug dealer said, well, maybe I did. Uh, sometimes people need to get hit. And Isaiah looked at him and said, well, that person you hit is a friend of mine. And I'm trying to get him housing. And I'm trying to help him with his ID. And I don't want you hitting people out here. And the drug dealer looked at Isaiah and he said, man, I'm sorry. I, I should have done that. I didn't know that he was one of your friends. I respect you guys for what you're doing for the neighborhood. I, I, I'm with you guys. I, I know that you're trying to help people out of the streets. I'm really sorry. I, I want to apologize to him and to everybody else. And, and he did. And it's the presence that's there. That, that really helps move things along and builds that relationship um, in the neighborhood. And um, Noel, I, I'd love you just to talk some more to us about 
proximity, uh, presence, and, and how that continues to build shalom in broken places. Yeah, I, I have to kind of go back into my uh, first uh, uh, few years there in San Francisco where uh, uh, one of the, the memories that I have seared in my mind is uh, as a young uh, youth worker, uh, you know, we were not there uh, making a bunch of money and barely kind of scraping by ourselves. And I remember one day going out on, on mission uh, uh, Avenue to uh, just, uh, I had gone for a run and I had, I just was walking back to my apartment and uh, a, a guy who was uh, kind of living on the streets, he came up to me and he asked me, you know, hey, would you uh, uh, help me with get a meal? And I said, man, I got nothing. And then he looked up and down, you know, he kind of saw how I was dressed and everything. And, and he knew that I, I, he picked the wrong guy, right? Uh, and then uh, I started to walk away and the guy came up to me, he pursued me and he said, hey, uh, let me buy you a cup of coffee. Why don't we see if, you, if you're willing to come sit down with me and let's jump into this little place. So he actually, you know, he actually invited me to go have a cup of coffee with him, you know, and uh, back then it was probably, you know, uh, 25 cents or 50 cents for a cup of coffee where we went. But I, but I never forgot that idea of how, in, in many ways, uh, what we see in the model of Jesus in the incarnation is this, this idea that, that God didn't come uh, uh, to, to uh, always uh, kind of ride in on that white horse, you know, the great uh, evangelical Christian hope. I mean, it's you start with uh, making a human connection, and and I just think that that is the power of of, of, uh, of presence and incarnation that we have to figure out. Uh, you know, uh, how do we connect with people at the deepest level? And uh, I, I think what that requires is uh, is this uh, idea that. Again, uh, you, that, that, that we're gripped by our own sense of, of, of uh, vulnerability and need uh, ourselves. I, I love that you're in San Francisco. I think like many of you uh, uh, who have been formed in, and have been involved in ministry there for a long time, St. Francis is one of my heroes. You know, I, I remember in college watching this movie about his life and and uh, here, here is this uh, very, you know, kind of wealthy guy that grows up in, in luxury and wealth and privilege. And he has an encounter with uh, the crucified Christ. And he basically, uh, you know, uh, is, senses God's call to give everything away, to leave his riches and to go out and, and, and to build the church, right? And for him, what that meant was to go be present with the, the poorest of the poor, the most vulnerable of the most vulnerable. And I, I think that uh, the core of my theological reflection over the years has really centered around that idea. Uh, why did God choose to incarnate himself in this little uh, town in Galilee, uh, a, a place that nobody knew about, insignificant, not to be reckoned with, why enter the world the way he did, why be born in that manger, why uh, be born, you know, the, the, in the kind of scandal of this, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it wasn't just that uh, uh, Mary was impregnated by God, by the Holy Spirit, and, and, and I was bearing the child of God, but it's the whole idea that it was while she was betrothed to be married to somebody, and 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 wow, the scandal of that, and I, and I think about uh, how scandalous life is for people, right? So many people that we encounter, and I know that you are working with in the tenderloin, and uh, anywhere that uh, that there are vulnerable communities, it's uh, it's so difficult to. Uh, to, to be able to even hold our heads up and to be able to look people in the eye and to relate to folks in a way 
where they feel uh, worthy of uh, being in a, in, a, in a reciprocal type of relationship. And so presence and, and saying, hey, I'm, I'm just going to be here with you is one of the most powerful ways of breaking through that kind of uh, that, that, that uh, barrier and the masks and the uh, inability for people to connect. And I, I want to commend those of you uh, there at YWAM in San Francisco, because you're, you're, you know, you're living in, and I don't have to tell you this, you're living in one of the most expensive cities in the world to live in. And, and to be incarnate in that city is no small task. But but you uh, have decided, you know, if we're going to minister to people in, in this community, we're going to be there in the tenderloin. We're going to be as close to that community as possible, right? And, and we're not just going to parachute in. Uh, and uh, I, again, the, uh, one of my favorite uh, just uh, points about the incarnation is that for 30 years, Jesus didn't have a public ministry. He just was there. He, he, he was just living uh, among, you know, his family and his neighbors. And when he finally entered the synagogue to read the passage out of Isaiah 61 to proclaim his ministry, you know, God's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor and to, you know, to uh, open up the hearts of, uh, of the eyes of the blind and to mend the brokenhearted to release the captive and to proclaim the, uh, the year of Jubilee, the year of, of God's uh, work in this world in a unique way, it, it all began with just being present. Yeah. And, and, and I think we cannot uh, overestimate uh, how important it is that you all are just there, that we're there wherever it is that God calls us to be. Uh, it, it begins by uh, figuring out what is it going to take to uh, demonstrate authentically that uh, I'm not here to help you from afar, but I'm here to be with you. Uh, I met a guy yesterday in Huntsville. His name is e Emmanuel, right? And when, I, when he told me his name, I said, God with us, right? That's it, that's, that's the gospel, that's the good news. That's where it all starts. The idea that God himself, the God of the universe, is with us and he pitched his tent among us and he moved into the neighborhood and we get to model that and we get to follow that example as uh as a an expression of our faith yeah it's so good noel um St steve hong is asking in the chat he said uh what have you found to be effective inviting others what have you found to be effective in inviting others on the journey of presence, and I, I think you've already answered it, but you, you want to just uh, say a quick yeah. something on that? Yeah, no, I, I, I think it's uh, uh, a lot of it so much as I, I talk about humility, right? The idea that you you start by being vulnerable yourself. I mean, I love the Samaritan woman at the well, right? Uh, you go and you and you say, can I have a cup of water, uh, you know? Uh, that we again, it's it's so uh, difficult for us to um, to uh, start with. Hey, I'm here to help you because the the moment we do that, we 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 are in such danger of a paternalistic approach. I right? I know that it's very uh, common in the professionalization of our work to begin talking about clients and you know we're the helpers and. And, and, and I understand all that language and sometimes we, we've got to use it, you know, when we're dealing with uh, state officials and governments and all, but, but I think we can never forget um, that we're, we're, we're talking about human contact. We're talking about, uh, you know, I, I, I think uh, one of the simplest things uh, I think, uh, Tim, is to eat a meal with somebody, right? To break, break bread. Uh, at, at, the, at the you know when there when Jesus was walking around on that Emmaus road and uh, he says let's let's have a meal together uh, he's revealed to his disciples who are in shambles who are not doing well after the loss of their savior and and here he is right 
uh, breaking bread with them. Uh, uh, the, the, the breaking of the bread, uh, uh, the, the Last Supper reminds us of, uh, of a God who really wants to fellowship with us. And, yeah. uh, and we get to invite people into that. And uh, so I, there's a million ways, right? And, and I think it just takes the creativity of the Holy Spirit, a willingness to, to just, uh, you know, uh, uh, take whatever's in your hand and uh, to begin uh, seeing how God leads you. Uh, I heard you be, uh, before our, our, our call today talking about, uh, you know, uh, starting to sell flowers and, and uh, do art and projects that beautify. And, oh my gosh, I mean, how much does the world need that? I mean, that is a kingdom ministry of incarnation, right? Uh, helping people to see that, uh, you know, God is present and that, uh, uh, that the streets, the, the streets are not void of God's beauty and love and compassion and grace. Uh, sometimes, though, uh, you know, we've got to really work hard to uh, make sure that people uh, experience that. Yeah, thanks, Noel. Uh, that, that story about what we were talking about with the flowers, uh, Kayla Binquist, who's on the call, is a florist and uh, Steve's wife and uh, she's starting to experiment with uh, floral arrangements with the unhoused. And I think there's a Christmas wreath program coming up that she's going to be working on. If that can be put in the chat, if we have a link, I don't even know if we do, uh, but love to get people involved in that. And that really, you know, we're talking about pursuing shalom through services, uh, pursuing shalom through presence. Uh, and then, you know, pursuing shalom, the, the third one, that I want you to really start expanding on is uh, pursuing shalom through relationships. And um, one of our guys, uh, Irwin, who works in our ministry, um, was, uh, you know, helps with our shower line and our showers. Here he is, you can see him giving a cup of, of coffee during pop up church um, outside, but he really helps with uh, a lot of our ministries and he's a real evangelist. And I, uh, and one guy always came every day for a shower, just every day he was there for a shower, trying to find a job. And Irwin didn't know him, but uh, just would sign him up for the shower. And one day he was praying. He said, Lord, uh, you know, I really just don't want to sign people up. I want to get to know people and I want to really build relationship. And so he went to this guy that came every day. And uh, instead of just signing him up, he said, hey, would you just take some time and tell me your story? And the guy told him his story and that he was homeless, and that he was without a job. And Irwin got talking to him and he said, uh, what's hindering you from getting a job? And he said, well, I don't have a license. And Irwin said to him, well, what's hindering you from getting a license? And he said, I don't have any money. And uh, Irwin got done giving showers and he took the guy, put him in his car or in our vehicle, our, our uh, vehicle that we use to take people to get services. And uh, he took him to the DMV and he paid out of his own pocket to get the guy his license. And I asked Irwin, even this morning, I asked him again, I said, has the guy come back? And he said, no, ever since I got him the license, he never came back, which is a good sign that he most likely got a job and he doesn't have time to come back. Um, but that's a little bit about how relationships, going out of our way, just not doing things for people, but saying, hey, what's your story? Uh, I know a lot of our guys are taking people, uh, some of the young house, they'll take them out to, to parks or they'll take them to movies um, and, and just build relationships. Noel, Noel, can you expand on pursuing shalom through relationships? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's such a simple and uncomplicated uh, concept in, in, in and of itself, but uh, there's, a, there's a few words that uh, when I think about this whole idea of shalom and, and, and how it impacts relationships that uh, I think are key in our understanding that as, um, as followers of Christ, I think we, we uh, would do well to examine a little bit more closely. The other word I think about is jubilee, right? Uh, it, this idea that... Uh, when God uh, created the nation of Israel, it was with a plan to say, you know, people uh, that you live close by, they're going to 
they're going to experience hard times. They're going to have economic hardships. They're going to lose loved ones. Many will find themselves to be widowed and orphaned and homeless and poor. But I want to institute a, uh, a way for folks that have fallen into hard times to not be stuck there generationally forever. So every 50 years, I want you to be the people that demonstrate shalom and love by forgiving debts, by giving people a new start. If somebody lost their house or their land because of whatever decisions that might, may not have even been good decisions, uh, they'll get a chance to reclaim those, right? Uh, so Jubilee is this radical idea and is actually uh, where we find uh, Isaiah 61, the, when he reads, Jesus reads that very first sermon uh, in Nazareth, it was a jubilee passage, this idea of liberation, of uh, being free from captivity. Part of relationship is wanting, uh, loving our neighbor as ourself, right? It's wanting what's best for others. Another powerful word uh, is justicia, which I love it in Spanish because uh, it is one word that means that that has a very deep sense of, of uh, meaning. It means uh, being right with God and doing right by others, right? Pursuing the right thing and the right action and looking out for, uh, uh, for, for, the, for the mistreatment of people. And I think part of a relational ministry is to, is to kind of look and say, uh, you know, why are you uh, uh, continuing to deal with some of the issues that you're dealing with? Uh, one of my uh, great friends and heroes in, in, uh, in Christian community development uh, was famous, uh, Mary Nelson, for jumping up and down and saying, you know, when you see people floating down the river and, and you're, you're there day after day uh, pulling them out of the river, it might be a good idea to go upstream and figure out who's pushing them in, right? Why are they still seeing so many people dealing with this homelessness or this mental illness or whatever it is that we're seeing on the streets, the chronic kind of expressions. And so when we, uh, when we talk about relationship, it's also saying uh, justicia uh, is about this idea that we love God and we love our neighbor in relationship. In fact, you know, it's impossible to talk about loving God without being in right relationship with uh, who, and then who's our neighbor, right? Jesus has a little bit to say about that in some of his greatest teachings and parables. So uh, shalom, uh, uh, jubilee, justicia, and then uh, there's a turn in the New Testament where God introduces this concept of the kingdom of God, right? That the kingdom, when, when Jesus comes to proclaim the good news, right? Uh, 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 almost every time that term is used, he comes to proclaim the good news in the gospels. It says the good news of the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is that, that, that new reality, this new empire that now has been initiated uh, that takes relationships seriously, where every single person matters, where we are uh, relentless in making sure that uh, we're our brother's keeper, that we're looking around and saying, look, uh, if, if I am truly in relationship with you, if I'm truly your neighbor, uh, I, I just cannot turn a blind eye to suffering and what's going on. And, and when we live in hard places, when your ministry is in the tenderloin and you really are in relationship with your neighbor, uh, the implications of that are so deep, okay? They, they, they are, they're just like, uh, it, 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 I mean, I'd love to say it's simple, you know? And, it's, it's, and it, yes, it begins with that kindness uh, and, and with that uh, smile and with that putting, uh, you know, uh, just a, a, a beginning a good positive relationship, but it, 
it, it's so much deeper. And uh, I, I think about um, um, what I've been reflecting on most recently, the fruit of the spirit, okay? The fruit of the spirit that Jesus promises to build into our lives. And I want to tell you that for a lot of years, and, and I think I, I have, uh, when you're passionate about justice, when you're passionate about shalom, when you kind of are this visionary leader that's always trying to rally the troops to do good in hard places, you know, what happens is uh, we can almost begin to think that, uh, you know, we got to do that at all costs. But the reality is, it's through the fruit of the Spirit that God intends us to do his good work of shalom, right? And uh, when I look at what is that fruit that God wants us to bear, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control, uh, if we could unleash that kind of fruit in our city in pursuit of shalom, in pursuit of justice, through incarnation, um, uh, I think God would be honored. I think God would really be uh, a demonstrated and we would bear witness to the reality of the kingdom of God in places that uh, really don't believe that God even cares, right? There's so many people that don't believe. They don't, they have no real uh, sense that God is on their side. And we get to declare with our lives and with our efforts that uh, uh, God is on the side of the poor. He's on the side of the vulnerable. He's on the side of the invisible, of the suffering, the hurting. And, and we're here to live that out with everything we do. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Noel. That's so, so rich, so rich. Pursuing shalom uh, through service, pursuing shalom through presence, pursuing shalom through relationship. And um, we're going to talk about, as we close things up here, pursuing shalom through dignity. Um, but I just want to just mention again that uh, we're trying to make up a 110K shortfall. Uh, we do have a 10K matching gift today. Um, so anything that you give will double. Uh, some people are asking, what does that 3646 cover? It covers uh, roughly everything that we do uh, for one person, not all at one time. Um, you know, that's hygiene kits, new pair of socks, new pair of underwear when they come in for showers, our shower services, our water, um, uh, our, our, our visits that we take them to uh, the different places to help them to get out, to get become unhoused. Um, you know, a lot of times people get tired of the broken bureaucracy in San Francisco, running from one place to the next, and they just give up after a while. Um, and so we go with them and, and stand in the line with them and help them fill out the forms. Um, that all takes our time. Um, so uh, that's, that's how, how we try to cover it. Uh, Steve, can you just share with us, uh, I'd love to hear from you again, uh, this whole concept of pursuing shalom through dignity. Um, I know that's really your heartbeat and that's what you breathe and what you live for. Um, could you just, Share with us uh, a story along that lines. Yeah, um, dignity is um, everything. I think in Matthew 25, when Jesus identifies himself with the least of these, I think it's a call to the church to how will we treat Jesus, right? And dignity is, is an obvious answer as we would give Jesus dignity. And one of the things um, in the, the moments in my life that have meant the most in walking with um, an individual on the street, we'll call him Ken. Um, I met him years ago and uh, Ken uh, was a meth head um, and uh, just was in his own world, loved to take apart electronics and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, and would just kind of sit and zone out in our drop-in center and sit on the wall and, you know, talk about conspiracy theories and all kinds of stuff. One day he had mentioned that he wanted to get in contact with his sister and through the power of Facebook, I found his sister. Um, and um, that next day actually, or within that week, his sister contacted me again 
uh, right before I got into work and said, I need to talk to Ken. Um, something happened in our family. And so um, he'd been estranged for quite a while and I found out his brother passed away. And so I got in and Ken was always the first in line to our drop-in center. So I said, hey, Ken, come on in. Uh, your sister wants to talk to you. So I brought him in my office, got him on the phone call with his sister. And after he hung up the phone call, he just broke down crying. And I didn't really know him too well at this point and didn't really know what else to do. And um, I don't know, sometimes when I don't know what else to do, I just kind of hug people. Uh, and so I just kind of gave him a bit of a hug and he just fell apart in my arms. And we were, um, we were, we had opened that day, that morning and he'd gone to his normal spot and um, a couple of us were just concerned. We were like, okay, what are we going to do? Like, um, you know, he's got what's going to happen. And uh, we just kind of on an off chance was just kind of like, hey, you know what, why don't you, can you help us today? Um, and he ended up uh, basically starting that day. He started helping us with, you know, our bathroom list, um, tracking who's using the bathroom and working our front desk a bit. For two and a half years, he just stood in that spot helping with our bathroom list and giving out mail and becoming a part of us. And went from someone who I never had a regular conversation with to someone who um, would talk to me about his heart and his, and his pain and, and his history. Um, asked him about housing at one point. And he said, you know, like, I can't get housing. The government's out to get me. I can't do it. Um, I can't trust the system. And like, all right, let's, oh, that's okay. And then a couple months later, I asked him again. And he said, it's impossible for me to get housing. And I was like, all right. Um, and he had been unhoused uh, for about 25, 26 years at that point. Um, so chronically homeless and um, was talking to him a bit more and said, you know what, Ken, I bet you biscuits and gravy that I can get you housing within a year if you just trust me. And he goes, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen, Steve. And I was like, I bet you biscuits and gravy because it was our favorite meal. And he goes, fine. He bet me biscuits and gravy. Um, and um, let's just say about six months later, he was buying me biscuits and gravy um, because we got him into housing. And it was just that relationship and that dignity of being with him. And just share this too, like, because I'm really passionate about this, like the dignity piece is relationship. It's sitting down with someone and having deep conversation. It's sitting down and having disagreements and it's apologizing for when I made mistakes in handling, you know, precious things for him and, and he was hurt by it and, and turning around and saying, man, I really blew it, I'm sorry. Like those are the dignity pieces. It's, it's a real life relationship and it's friendship and it's, it's weeping with those who weep and rejoicing with those who rejoice. And that's what, that's what we wanna do through everything that we do um, is with every person. Like a shower is just a shower. But the reality is that we want to connect with people relationally and we want to walk with them as they walk through life. 20 years of being on the streets and without home, like you need someone to go with you. You can't just go by yourself. And so we go with people. Um, and sometimes that's a day process and sometimes that's two and a half, three, four, five, six years. So, yeah. Thanks so much, Steve. That's, that's uh, really great. Uh, Noel, can you just... Close us up here um, with and, and just elaborate uh, from the yeah. on pursuing shalom through dignity. We've heard about through services, we've heard through presence, we heard through relationships. Um, send us off with on dignity. <laughs> yeah, I, I think what I um, what I would love to just uh, think about for a minute is is a little bit of the story of, of the Mission District in San Francisco in relationship to the many uh, um, um, migrants from El Salvador that have come to your city, right? And, and this is just, I mean, there's a lot of examples, but I think about how uh, over the years, uh, uh, not just in San Francisco, but then uh, many moving to Los Angeles, uh, these um, uh, migrant uh, young people from a, a little little tiny country in Central America, uh, they began to organize to uh, protect themselves because they had nobody looking out for them, right? And uh, surrounded in a dominant community of many Mexican American gangs and other African American gangs, they began to organize into maras or gangs and, and uh, 
became uh, just extremely uh, well versed at this kind of uh, violent gang life. And, uh, and then uh, when the US began to, um, to crack down on, on immigration and uh, even after 9-11 and all the stuff that happened, uh, many of these uh, young men were deported back home. And uh, what happened is they uh, ended up showing up back in their countries and still with very little uh, resource and, uh, uh, you know, not much uh, education and financial wherewithal. And, and, but now showing up, uh, having adopted the ways of the gangs in the U.S., tattoos everywhere and, and uh, you know, uh, really focusing most of their efforts on kind of criminal uh, activity and survival and, and violence and, and just having lost all sense of uh, uh, the, the, the meaning of human life, right? The, so somehow in that whole process, dignity uh, ha, was uh, exploded and, and dissipated. And uh, what I have been discovering as I've been going down to Latin America the last few years, is that uh, there's very few people that even know what to do uh, with that population. I mean, they're kind of the discarded uh, uh, kind of, uh, think about the leper where when you see somebody coming, you go to the other side of the road. Well, um, there the, the violence and the danger is such that, uh, you know, nobody really even believes that this group of young people can be redeemed. I was there just a few weeks ago and I visited a very, very poor uh, gang infested neighborhood. And I was able to go, uh, a, a pastor friend of mine took me to meet a, 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 a Christian guy, right? He's not a pastor, not a missionary. This guy, uh, he, he has a business where he, uh, he fixes cars, uh, body work, does body work and is employing a bunch of kids in the neighborhood. And I went to his house and I met him and here's what happened. Uh, probably 15 or 20 guys started pouring out of this little house. And uh, they're all ex gang members and they're all tatted up. And I'm telling you, I was glad I was with him because he knew the neighborhood. And, uh, and uh, so he started introducing me to all of these young men and um, but what I come to discover is that these, there are about a dozen of these ex gang members were living with him and his wife in their little tiny house. They just found a place for them and they're just, you know, they're, uh, feeding them every day. They're, uh, try to give them jobs as much as possible, try to help them, uh, uh, find their way, uh, teaching about, about Christ. And the guy kept telling me, I'm not a pastor. I'm not, you know, that's not my thing. I mean, I'm not a pastor. I'm just trying to love these guys in the name of Jesus and wanting to, you know, be the presence of God in their lives. And, uh, and I, I just was absolutely blown away by that encounter because here's a guy who, uh, out of just a very organic desire to respond to the grace of God in his own life, as you can imagine, one of the reasons why he uh, felt this way is because he had been involved in the gangs himself and, and he was redeemed by God's love. And so now he's willing to kind of do whatever it takes to be engaged. And uh, what, what surprised me as I was leaving is, you know, uh, many of us think that what the answer to these gang issues in Latin America or in our cities and the violence in our communities is we got to start another program, right? We got to, there's got to be another uh, effort. The government's got to give more money and everyone's got it. And, and the idea that I walked away with is, you know, uh, we all have a part to play. We all can do something. And what was most powerful is that these guys did not see themselves as uh, 
clients of a program, recipients of, of some kind of charity. You know, they were part of the family. They were incorporated into the life of that home and they had chores and they were working and they were doing, they were cooking, they were doing all. And, and I think that if you were to examine the life of Jesus, you know, uh, uh, and as we see it in the gospels, it's Jesus walking with a bunch of people that nobody else really believed had much to offer. I think dignity says, uh, is, is, is a deep sense that every human being on the planet of the earth has something to contribute and has a piece of the image of God in them. And, uh, and that it is just waiting to be uh, kind of unleashed on the world. And we get a chance to be a part of helping that uh, be released and become a part of the solution uh, in the world. And so I think about um, what we have as an opportunity. Uh, uh, the men and women that live on the street, the boys and girls that, that uh, you know, uh, Gabby and Matteo and others are working with, and, and that, that so many of you are ministering to, Tim, all the folks that you work with, uh, they're not just clients. They're, uh, they're the leaders that God is raising up in San Francisco to reach people that nobody else can reach with the love of God. Uh, but it's not just uh those folks there it's you know there are people all over the world praying for san francisco and what you're doing intercessors right they're 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 folks just like crying out to god and saying lord i'm not there on the front lines like ywam is in san francisco but i can be there in prayer i can i i see the need i see the reality of what's going on and uh i i commit to be a prayer warrior for uh uh, for the ministry there. And, and boy, what a powerful uh, way to demonstrate a commitment to the dignity of every single human being, right, that, that's involved. And then, and then there's, uh, then there the, the, the uh, kind of the implementers, right, the, the ones that are on the, on the ground doing the work. Uh, all of that is really absolutely important. And then, uh, but then finally, um, you know, it's the, the financial investors, right? Those that say, uh, you know what, uh, God has blessed me and I have, have so much and, and maybe I don't have as much as I want, but I know that uh, there's a need here that I can contribute to. And uh, to do the kind of work that we're talking about, it takes uh, resource. And uh, uh, Ron Spann is on the call from Detroit. And, and Ron, I, you, you, you remember when Heyman Cross uh, at a CCDA conference, I think number three, uh, gave his great sermon about the paralytic that was uh, lowered down uh, in front of Jesus in, in this home filled with religious people and, and uh, teachers and Pharisees and scribes. And uh, the story is uh, uh, there's a man, young man who's paralyzed and can't get into the presence of Jesus. And four friends are plotting, how do we get our friend into to see Jesus? But there's no room in the house is what the text says in Luke chapter five. And so one of them, you know, I, I can just imagine, you know, had the idea, let's go and Let's let's why don't we put them up on the roof and lower them down? And uh, oh man, that's a crazy idea. And uh, and this is Haman's uh, sermon, right? You know, thirty years ago. Uh, and so let's put them up on the roof. Crazy, you know that that innovative uh, initiator. And then uh, somebody had to take that idea and say, okay, we can make it happen. Let's get a ladder. Let's we got to tear off five or six tiles. We can get them down there. We need some rope. The uh, uh, you know the intercessor, the the, the that innovator to make, uh, and, and then the implementer to get it done, and then uh, uh, finally somebody had to say, you know, uh, uh, there's going to be a, a really angry uh, homeowner when we uh, uh, get done tearing that roof off. We're going to have to fix it. You know, we're going to have to take care of the expense of doing this uh, really cool ministry and. Uh, and, and it took all of these folks, these four young men, and when they 
brought him into the presence of Jesus, their friend. Jesus looked at the four young guys and said, their faith is, is, is unbelievable. I've never seen faith like this. And then their faith is becomes the catalyst for Jesus to uh, just heal this guy. And he doesn't just heal his body, you know, which is, I think is also, uh, I think so much of what you all are doing in San Francisco is uh, if all we were doing is giving showers and giving meals and, uh, you know, counseling, that would be amazing. I mean, in and of itself, mm. but what we also are offering is something that nobody, none of us can give. And that is uh, that the Jesus looked at that young man. And he said, your sins are forgiven. You know, that deep hole in your heart, that wound that um, keeps you from really understanding who you are, who you were created to be, that lack of dignity that you feel, the way that you feel mistreated. Uh, uh, he, uh, Jesus, uh, makes him whole on the inside. And I think that's the story of Shalom, right? is that we work and we all contribute what we can and what he calls us to do to unleash a revolution of God's shalom in the world and the place that he has called us to be. And lives are changed, lives are transformed. I, I uh, you know, I, I can never really understand how God took me from a little border town in Texas Mm -hmm. uh, born just a couple miles on this side of the border, which has changed everything, right? Because if I had been born just a couple miles the other way in Mexico, uh, my life would be very different. But if anything I've done over the last 40, 50 years of ministry, uh, through all the ups and downs and the mistakes and the hardships and the problems and the joys and the accolades and the you know you name it it's a mix of everything it, it, it's it's the only thing that counts really is uh the gratitude that god has filled my heart with to say uh lord uh i don't do this uh, to get anything uh, i do this because I, I just want to demonstrate my own gratitude to you for how you've worked in my life. And, and I think that's the kind of, uh, uh, of of givers that God wants to see, the kind of investors, the kind of people that he is uh, pulling together to build ministries all over the world. I, I, I am amazed at the generosity of the body of Christ to do good work all over the world. And uh, Tim, I, I pray that uh, you, you, you meet that $10,000 match and the the gap that you have and, and because what you're doing is so important and it's so needed. And uh, when we uh, when we all do our part, uh, uh, God can do uh, uh, amazing transformative work. He can raise up uh, lives that uh, seem like they would never walk and uh, give a brand new start and a new beginning. And uh, we get to be a part of that. So thank you for letting me uh, be a part of this time again as well. Thank you, Noel. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us as we uh, talked about pursuing shalom through service, pursuing shalom through presence, pursuing shalom through relationships, and pursuing shalom through dignity. That's what we really want to do. I know there's many on this call that just have deep stories and ministries uh, over the years that are proving that. Uh, whether it's uh, Paul Trudeau with City Hope. Uh, Paul, please put your website in the chat there and Dennis Adams with uh, the Church of God and all that he's doing and uh, different ones that are serving. Thank you to Joshua Lee that keeps our internet functioning here all the time for us. And uh, so many that are on this call, uh, just really appreciate uh, your labor of love. And uh, we are uh, running short uh, this year, $110,000, and we're kicking it off with this event with the 10K match, um, and we're going to keep fundraising to the end of the year to meet that goal. We believe that we're going to meet it and go beyond, um, and we want to invite you into that. Again, uh, we, our, our finance office worked really hard and looked at all of our costs and expenditures of what we do for people, 
the unhoused, and uh, we said it's about $36.46 of serving uh, one person, not in one day, but over a period of time with all the different things that we do. Uh, and it's really been proving fruitful. Uh, people are getting off the street. We're watching people that are going into housing um, as we put more and more um, effort into those individuals. Steve is beginning to call our workers street monks and uh, having them on the street serving people's uh, felt needs and then going into helping them through the bureaucracy and getting them into housing. So uh, God bless you. I uh, really appreciate everyone being on this call and all the effort that you uh, put in uh, to that.